Hi everyone um, who's joining us online tonight and uh, a very warm welcome to Dr. Jackie Simon Gunn. Um, it's great having you with us again, Jackie. Thanks for having me back, John. Always uh, great working with you. Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's great to have you and um, a warm welcome to everyone in who's online and there's a lot of people in the chat room. Um, and we just want to say a little bit about the format, I guess, Jackie, don't we, before we start. Um, you've got a lecture for us tonight that could go, I guess, a number of different ways. So you're saying, well, yes. you're going to get started and I'll keep my eye on the chat room. I'll be in the chat room too. And if there's some things, kind of the way the chat room's leaning, you're up for hearing about it and kind of bending the lecture that way, I guess. Sure. And also it'd be good to know if like, I'm, I tend to try to be as jargon free as possible, but because this lecture is really focusing on emotional states that can be quite elaborate. If I'm, if people are not understanding the language, which shouldn't happen based on the way I plan to present this, but if it does like, let me know so I could um, explain stuff. Hmm. Um, yeah. I don't want people to miss anything, it's important for everyone, not just mental health professionals. Yeah. So. Yeah. So maybe some. Sometimes you, you'd be up for some feedback about the vocabulary as well, I guess. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we're going to go. I mean, you're going to present um, for about forty-five minutes or so. Then we're going to take a wee break, and then we will go into full kind of question and answer format for about another half an hour. Or so. Yeah, we've got plenty of time just to hear from you and chat and great. So, Jackie, we're really looking forward. Well, let me say the name of the lecture and then we can get started. Um, okay. Shame, guilt and empathy in intimate relationship violence. Yes. Okay, so let me just start off saying that this uh, research is coming from the my dissertation topic so i have extended the research since then um i haven't yet i'm not sure what i'll do with the extension of the research but i will be sharing things that are both in my dissertation and then go slightly beyond my dissertation um so again for people in the chat room i'm going to start this just the way my dissertation reads and i, I promise no statistics or boring um, jargony things, but um, if there is a particular area that seems that a lot of people have questions, uh, maybe if you post them in the chat room, John can let could sort of direct me to what you're thinking. Okay, so I'm going to start with first explaining the relate how, how the self evolves and what what can happen to one sense of self in the face of shame. So I'm going to be, the first thing that's important, I'm going to be distinguishing between two different types of shame. Okay, so first let me say that shame is an affect state, meaning it's an emotional state, it's a feeling state, which makes it different than self-esteem, self-consciousness, or any of the usual words that we use to define self-concepts. Those are cognitive, um, inquiries that are painful about oneself. So when we say someone has low self-esteem, that's a cognitive thought process that we evaluate ourselves and we find something negative about it. Shame is an emotion. It is the deepest emotion. It's the most all-encompassing emotion and it is the, mo the most painful of any emotional state that a human being can experience. We all have a sense of shame, which develops, I mean, the studies show based on like, for example, Daniel Stern, who uh, worked with uh, analyzing children at around 18 months. Now, of course, this is an approximation when young, young children begin to notice themselves in the mirror and know that that reflection is themselves. That's sort of when the possibility of shame arises. I'm talking about normal shame. Because in order, one of the things that um, suggests shame is the awareness of another. So there's a, there is a, 
shame happens only once a child can be aware that they can be viewed by, by other people. And in that view, there can be a negative evaluation. So we see it evolving. I think probably if I, I don't want to make this too complicated, but if I went into Freud and I looked for like, say, the themes that suggested shame, I think he would probably say it was younger, but I don't agree with that. I think I think I follow more of like Stern and Kohut and some of these bit later theorists where shame evolving in a normal person, we all do it, around 18 months. Um, and for those of you who have kids or work with very little children, you can notice this by like an awareness of the reflection in the mirror. Um, when this happens, um, this is when young children, ourselves, all of us, start the development of our self-concept begins evolving. And this is based on how we see other people seeing us based on comments, gestures, lack of gestures, and it evolves over time. So in a healthy state of shame, basically what you have is, you know, uh, some event takes place and in that event, the person feels like a failure and they feel bad. They feel not like they did something bad, which implies guilt, which I'll get into shortly, but, but rather it implies that they are bad. That feeling is transient for uh, for those of us who are fortunate enough not to have patholog pathological shame. In a normal shame experience, it, it's painful, you feel bad, and it passes. Okay, so in... Um, the, so on the on the flip side of this, and this will be more important going forward, which is what I, what I, I'm calling very like flippantly pathological shame, and I'm calling it pathological because I want to distinguish it from normal, which I don't even like these words, but I need to use them just to be clear. So the term in the literature, this is not my term, but I'm borrowing it from June Tagney, who's like the most researched, most well-versed person in the research on shame, Dr. June Tagney. She's at George Mason University in Virginia, and I use a lot of her research. She developed the name shame prone for people who have a pervasive sense of shame. So this is what happens in, in beginning around that 18 months where there is an awareness of oneself, a child is criticized on a regular basis. Those criticisms are not about something they did or didn't do. So it's not like um, doing something wrong where there is an actual connection between a behavior and having done something wrong where it can be fixed. The assaults to the self are very general and all encompassing. So the child, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. The child, you know, basically gets in trouble, say, I guess, in nursery school, because I'm going way back starting. It's not, you know, you shouldn't act like this or your behavior was inappropriate. What the assaults to people who eventually become shame prone are more like, you're bad. See, you're bad. You're just a bad kid. You're never going to amount to anything. Oh, no one's ever going to like you because you're, you're a mean person and you're a horrible person. Other things that can happen is complete negligence of the evolving self where there's no recognition of an active being in the process of growing, which would look like lack of acknowledgement around things that are accomplishments, like, like a little kid learning how to tie their shoelaces. That's a big accomplishment for a little kid. I can remember...